Chapter 3.31 Part 2 of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America During the Years 1799 to 1804, Volume 3, by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3.31 Part 2 The primitive population of the West India Islands having entirely disappeared, the Zambo Caribs, a mixture of natives and negroes, having been transported in 1796 from St. Vincent to the island of Rattan, the present population of the islands, 2,850,000, must be considered as composed of European and African blood. The negroes of pure race form nearly two-thirds, the whites one-fifth, and the mixed race one-seventh. In the Spanish colonies of the continent, we find the descendants of the Indians who disappeared among the Mestizos and Zambos, a mixture of Indians with whites and Negroes. The archipelago of the West Indies suggests no such consolatory idea. The state of society was there such at the beginning of the 16th century that, with some rare exceptions, the new planters paid as little attention to the natives as the English now do in Canada. The Indians of Cuba have disappeared like the Guanches of the Canaries, although at Guanabacoa and Tenerife false pretensions have renewed forty years ago by several families who obtained small pensions from the government on pretext of having in their veins some drops of Indian or Guanche blood. It is impossible now to form an accurate judgment of the population of Cuba or Haiti in the time of Columbus. How can we admit with some that the island of Cuba at its conquest in 1511 had a million of inhabitants, and that there remained of that million, in 1517, only 14,000. The statistic statements in the writing of the Bishop of Chiapa are full of contradictions. It is related that the Dominican monk, Fray Luis Bertram, who was persecuted by the encomenderos, as the Methodists are now by some English planters, predicted that the 200,000 Indians which Cuba contained would perish the victims of the cruelty of Europeans. Note. See the curious revelations in Juan de Marietta, His de todos los santos de España, Libro 7, page 174. End of note. If this be true, we may at least conclude that the native race was far from being extinct between the years 1555 and 1569. But according to Gomara, such as the confusion among the historians of those times, there were no longer any Indians on the island of Cuba in 1553. To form an idea of the vagueness of the estimates made by the first Spanish travellers, at a period when the population of no province of the peninsula was ascertained, we have but to recollect that the number of inhabitants which Captain Cook and other navigators assigned to Otaheite and the Sandwich Islands at a time when statistics furnished the most exact comparisons, varied from one to five. We may conceive that the island of Cuba, surrounded with coasts adapted for fishing, might, from the great fertility of its soil, afford sustenance for several millions of those Indians who have no desire for animal food, and who cultivate maize, manioc, and other nourishing roots. But had there been that amount of population, would it not have been manifest by a more advanced degree of civilization than the narrative of Columbus describes. Would the people of Cuba have remained more backward in civilization than the inhabitants of the Lucayas Islands? Whatever activity may be attributed to causes of destruction, such as the tyranny of the conquistadors, the faults of governors, the too severe labors of the gold washings, the smallpox, and the frequency of suicides, it would be difficult to conceive how, in thirty or forty years, three or four hundred thousand Indians could entirely disappear note the rage of hanging themselves by whole families in huts and caverns as related by garcilaso was no doubt the effect of despair yet instead of lamenting the barbarism of the sixteenth century it was attempted to exculpate the conquistadors by attributing the disappearance of the natives to their taste for suicide see patriota tome two page fifty numerous sophisms of this kind are found in a work published by monsieur nuis on the humanity of the spaniards at the conquest of America. This work is entitled Reflexiones Imparciales sobre la Humanidad de los Españoles contra los Pretendidos Filosofos y Políticos para ilustrar las historias de Reynal y Robertson 
escrito en italiano por el abate don juan luis y traducido el castellano por don pedro varela y ulloa del consejo de s m seventeen fifty two impartial reflections on the humanity of the spaniards intended to convert pretended philosophers and politicians and to illustrate the histories of reynal and robertson written in italian by the abate don juan luis and translated into castilian by don pedro varela y ulloa member of his majesty's council the author who calls the expulsion of the moors under philip the third a meritorious and religious act terminates his work by congratulating the indians of america quote, on having fallen into the hands of the spaniards whose conduct has been at all times the most humane and the government the wisest end quote. several pages of this book recall the salutary rigor of the dragonades and that odious passage in which a man distinguished for his talents and his private virtues the count de mestre soire de saint petersburg tome two page one hundred and twenty one justifies the inquisition of portugal quote, which he observes has only caused some drops of guilty blood to flow end quote. to what sophisms must they have recourse who would defend religion national honour or the stability of governments by exculpating all that is offensive to humanity in the actions of the clergy the people or kings it is vain to seek to destroy the power most firmly established on earth namely the testimony of history End of note. The war with the cacique Hatue was short and was confined to the most eastern part of the island. Few complaints arose against the administration of the two first Spanish governors, Diego Velasquez and Pedro de Barba. The oppression of the natives dates from the arrival of the cruel Hernando de Soto about the year 1539. Supposing with Gamara that fifteen years later, under the government of Diego de Majariegos, fifteen fifty four to fifteen sixty four there were no longer any indians in cuba we must necessarily admit that considerable remains of that people saved themselves by means of canoes in florida believing according to ancient traditions that they were returning to the country of their ancestors the mortality of the negro slaves observed in our days in the west indies can alone throw some light on these numerous contradictions to columbus and velasquez the island of cuba must have appeared well peopled if for instance it contained as many inhabitants as were found there by the english in seventeen sixty two note columbus relates that the island of haiti was sometimes attacked by a race of black men gente negra who lived more to the south or southwest he hoped to visit them in his third voyage because those black men possessed a metal of which the admiral had procured some pieces in his second voyage these pieces were sent to spain and found to be composed of zero point six three of gold zero point one four of silver and zero point one nine of copper in fact balboa discovered this black tribe in the isthmus of darien quote, that conquistador end quote, says gomara quote, entered the province of quareca he found no gold but some blacks who were slaves of the lord of the place he asked this lord whence he had received them who replied that men of that colour lived near the place with whom they were constantly at war these negroes end quote, adds gomara quote, exactly resemble those of guinea and no others have since been seen in america on los indios yo pienso que no se han visto negros dispues end quote. End of note. the passage is very remarkable hypotheses were formed in the sixteenth century as now and petrus martyr imagined that these men seen by balboa the quarecas were ethiopian blacks who as pirates infested the seas and had been shipwrecked on the coast of america but the negroes of sudan are not pirates and it is easier to conceive that eskimos in their boats of skins may have gone to europe than the africans to darien those learned speculators who believe in a mixture of the polynesians with the americans rather consider the quarecas as of the race of papuans similar to the negritos of the philippines tropical migrations from west to east from the most western part of polynesia to the isthmus of darien present great difficulties although the winds blow during whole weeks from the west above all it is essential to know whether the quarecas were really like the negroes of sudan as gomara asserts or whether they were only a race of very dark indians with smooth and glossy hair who from time to time before fourteen ninety two infested the coasts of the island of haiti 
which has become in our days the domain of ethiopians the first travellers were easily deceived by the crowds which appeared of european vessels brought together on some points of the coast now the island of cuba with the same cuidades and vias which it possesses at present had not in seventeen sixty two more than two hundred thousand inhabitants and yet among a people treated like slaves exposed to the violence and brutality of their masters to excess of labour want of nourishment and the ravages of the smallpox forty-two years would not suffice to obliterate all but the remembrance of their misfortunes on the earth in several of the lesser antilles the population diminishes under english domination five and six per cent annually at cuba more than eight per cent but the annihilation of two hundred thousand in forty-two years supposes an annual loss of twenty-six per cent a loss scarcely credible although we may suppose that the mortality of the natives of cuba was much greater than that of the negroes bought at a very high price in studying the history of the island we observe that the movement of colonization has been from east to west and that here as everywhere in the spanish colonies the places first peopled are now the most desert the first establishment of the whites was in fifteen eleven when according to the orders of don diego columbus together with the conquistador and poblador velazquez he landed at puerto de palmas near cape macy then called alpha e omega and subdued the cacique hatue who an immigrant and fugitive from haiti had withdrawn to the eastern part of the island of cuba and had become the chief of a confederation of petty native princes the building of the town of baracoa was begun in fifteen twelve and later puerto principe trinidad the via de santo espiritu santiago de cuba fifteen fourteen san salvador de bayamo and san cristobal de la havana this last town was originally founded in fifteen fifteen on the southern coast of the island in the partido of guinas and transferred four years later to puerto de carinas the position of which at the entrance of the two channels of bahama el viejo y de nuevo appears to be much more favourable to commerce than the coast of the south-west of batabano note a tree is still shown at the havana at puerto de carinas under the shade of which the spaniards celebrated their first mass the island now called officially the ever faithful island of cuba was after its discovery named successively juana fernandina isla de santiago and isla del ave maria its arms date from the year fifteen sixteen end of note the progress of civilization since the sixteenth century has had a powerful influence on the relations of the castes with each other these relations vary in the districts which contain only farms for cattle and in those where the soil has been long cleared in the seaports and inland towns in the spots where colonial produce is cultivated and in such as produce maize vegetables and forage until the latter part of the eighteenth century the number of female slaves in the sugar plantations of cuba was extremely limited and what may appear surprising is that a prejudice founded on religious scruples opposed the introduction of women whose price at the havana was generally one-third less than that of men the slaves were forced to celibacy on the pretext of avoiding moral disorder the jesuits and bethlemite monks alone renounced that fatal prejudice and encouraged negresses in their plantations if the census no doubt imperfect of seventeen seventy five yielded fifteen thousand five hundred and sixty two female and twenty nine thousand three hundred and sixty six male slaves we must not forget that that enumeration comprehended the totality of the island and that the sugar plantations occupy even now but a quarter of the slave population after the year seventeen ninety five the consulado of the havana began to be seriously occupied with the project of rendering the increase of the slave population more independent of the variations of the slave trade don francisco arango whose views were ever characterized by wisdom proposed a tax on the plantations in which the number of slaves was not comprised of one-third females he also proposed a tax of six piastres on every negro brought into the island and from which the women negras posales should be exempt these measures were not adopted because the colonial assembly refused to employ coercive means but a desire to promote marriages and to improve the condition of the children of slaves has existed since that period when a cedula real 
of the twenty second april eighteen o four recommended those objects quote, to the conscience and humanity of the planters end quote. the first introduction of negroes into the eastern part of the island of cuba took place in fifteen twenty one and their number did not exceed three hundred the spaniards were then much less eager for slaves than the portuguese for in fifteen thirty nine there was a sale of twelve thousand negroes at lisbon as in our days to the eternal shame of christian europe the trade in greek slaves is carried on at constantinople and smyrna in the sixteenth century the slave trade was not free in spain the privilege of trading which was granted by the court was purchased in fifteen eighty six for all spanish america by gaspar de peralta in fifteen ninety five by gomez reynel and in sixteen fifteen by antonio rodriguez de elvas the total importation then amounted to only three thousand five hundred negroes annually and the inhabitants of cuba who were wholly engaged in rearing cattle scarcely received any during the war of succession french ships were accustomed to stop at the havana and to exchange slaves for tobacco the asiento treaty with the english in some degree augmented the introduction of negroes yet in seventeen sixty three although the taking of the havana and the sojourn of strangers gave rise to new wants the number of slaves in the jurisdiction of the havana did not amount to twenty five thousand and in the whole island not to thirty two thousand the total number of african negroes imported from fifteen twenty one to seventeen sixty three was probably sixty thousand their descendants survive among the free mulattoes who inhabit for the most part the eastern side of the island from the year seventeen sixty three to seventeen ninety when the negro trade was declared free the havana received twenty four thousand eight hundred and seventy five by the compania de tobacos four thousand nine hundred and fifty seven from seventeen sixty three to seventeen sixty six by the contract of the marques de casa andril fourteen thousand one hundred and thirty two from seventeen seventy three to seventeen seventy nine by the contract of baker and dawson five thousand seven hundred and eighty six from seventeen eighty six to seventeen eighty nine if we estimate the introduction of slaves in the eastern part of the island during those twenty-seven years seventeen sixty three to seventeen ninety at six thousand we find from the discovery of the island of cuba or rather from fifteen twenty one to seventeen ninety a total of ninety thousand eight hundred and seventy five we shall see soon that by the ever-increasing activity of the slave trade the fifteen years that followed seventeen ninety furnished more slaves than the two centuries and a half which preceded the period of the free trade that activity was redoubled when it was stipulated between england and spain that the slave trade should be prohibited north of the equator from november twenty second eighteen seventeen and entirely abolished on the thirtieth may eighteen twenty the king of spain accepted from england which posterity will one day scarcely believe a sum of four hundred thousand pounds sterling as a compensation for the loss which might result from the cessation of that barbarous commerce jamaica received from africa in the space of three hundred years eight hundred and fifty thousand blacks or to fix on a more certain estimate in one hundred and eight years from seventeen hundred to eighteen o eight nearly six hundred and seventy seven thousand and yet that island does not now possess three hundred and eighty thousand blacks free mulattoes and slaves the island of cuba furnishes a more consoling result it has one hundred and thirty thousand free men of colour whilst jamaica on a total population half as great contains only thirty five thousand on comparing the island of cuba with jamaica the result of the comparison seems to be in favour of the spanish legislation and the morals of the inhabitants of cuba these comparisons demonstrate a state of things in the latter island more favourable to the physical preservation and to the liberation of the blacks but what a melancholy spectacle is that of christian and civilised nations discussing which of them has caused the fewest africans to perish during the interval of three centuries by reducing them to slavery much cannot be said in commendation of the treatment of the blacks in the southern parts of the united states but there are degrees in the sufferings of the human species a slave who has a hut and a family is less miserable than he who is purchased as if he formed part of a flock the greater number of slaves established with their families in dwellings which they believe to be their own property the more rapidly will their numbers increase 
the annual increase of the last ten years in the united states without counting the manumission of one hundred thousand was twenty-six on a thousand which produces a doubling in twenty-seven years now if the slaves at jamaica and cuba had multiplied in the same proportion those two islands the former since seventeen ninety five and the latter since eighteen hundred would possess almost their present population without four hundred thousand blacks having been dragged from the coast of africa to port royal and the havana the mortality of the negroes is very different in the island of cuba as in all the west indies according to the nature of their treatment the humanity of masters and overseers and the number of negresses who can attend to the sick there are plantations in which fifteen to eighteen per cent perish annually i have heard it coolly discussed whether it were better for the proprietor not to subject the slaves to excessive labour and consequently to replace them less frequently or to draw all the advantage possible from them in a few years and replace them oftener by the acquisition of bozal negroes such are the reasonings of cupidity when man employs man as a beast of burden it would be unjust to entertain a doubt that within fifteen years negro mortality has greatly diminished in the island of cuba several proprietors have made laudable efforts to improve the plantation system it has been remarked how much the population of the island of cuba is susceptible of being augmented in the lapse of ages as the native of a northern country little favoured by nature i may observe that the mark of brandenburg for the most part sandy contains under an administration favourable to the progress of agricultural industry on a surface of only one-third of that of cuba a population nearly double the extreme inequality in the distribution of the population the want of inhabitants on a great part of the coast and its immense development render the military defence of the whole island impossible neither the landing of an enemy nor illicit trade can be prevented the havana is well defended and its works rival those of the most important fortified towns of europe the torriones and the fortifications of coimar haruco matanzas mariel bahia honda batabana jagua and trinidad might resist for a considerable time the assaults of an enemy but on the other hand two-thirds of the island are almost without defence and could scarcely be protected by the best gunboats intellectual cultivation is almost entirely limited to the whites and is as unequally distributed as the population the best society of the havana may be compared for easy and polished manners with the society of cadiz and with that of the richest commercial towns of europe but on quitting the capital or the neighbouring plantations which are inhabited by rich proprietors a striking contrast to this state of partial and local civilization is manifest in the simplicity of manners prevailing in the inland farms and small towns the habaneros or natives of the havana were the first among the rich inhabitants of the spanish colonies who visited spain france and italy and at the havana the people were always well informed of the politics of europe this knowledge of events this prescience of future chances have powerly aided the inhabitants of cuba to free themselves from some of the burthens which check the development of colonial prosperity in the interval between the peace of versailles and the beginning of the revolution of san domingo the havana appeared to be ten times nearer to spain than to mexico caracas and new granada fifteen years later at the period of my visit to the colonies this apparent inequality of distance had considerably diminished now when the independence of the continental colonies the importance of foreign manufactures and the financial wants of the new states have multiplied the intercourse between europe and america when the passage is shortened by improvements in navigation when the colombians the mexicans and the inhabitants of guatemala rival each other in visiting europe the ancient spanish colonies those at least that are bathed by the atlantic seem alike to have drawn nearer to the continent such are the changes which a few years have produced and which are proceeding with increasing rapidity they are the effects of knowledge and of long restrained activity and they render less striking the contrast in manners and civilization which i observed at the beginning of the century at caracas bogota quito lima mexico and the havana the influences of the basque catalanian galician and andalusian origin become every day more imperceptible the island of cuba does not possess those great and magnificent establishments the foundation of which is a very remote date in mexico but the havana can boast of institutions 
which the patriotism of the inhabitants animated by a happy rivalry between the different centres of american civilization will know how to extend and improve whenever political circumstances and confidence in the preservation of internal tranquillity may permit the patriotic society of the havana established in seventeen ninety three those of santo espiritu puerto principe and trinidad which depend on it the university with its chairs in theology jurisprudence medicine and mathematics established since seventeen twenty eight in the convent of the padres predecedores note the clergy of the island of cuba is neither numerous nor rich if we accept the bishop of the havana and the archbishop of cuba the former of whom has a hundred and ten thousand piastres and the latter forty thousand piastres per annum the canons have three thousand piastres the number of ecclesiastics does not exceed eleven hundred according to the official enumeration in my possession End of note. the chair of political economy founded in eighteen eighteen that of agricultural botany the museum and the school on descriptive anatomy due to the enlightened zeal of don alexander ramirez the public library the free school of drawing and painting the national school the lancastrian schools and the botanic garden are institutions partly new and partly old some stand in need of progressive amelioration others require a total reform to place them in harmony with the spirit of the age and the wants of society End of chapter three point thirty one part two chapter three point thirty one part three of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point thirty one part three agriculture when the spaniards began their settlements in the islands and on the continent of america those productions of the soil chiefly cultivated were as in europe the plants that served to nourish man this primitive stage of the agricultural life of nations has been preserved till the present time in mexico in peru in the cold and temperate regions of cundinamarca in short wherever the domination of the whites comprehends a vast extent of territory the alimentary plants bananas manioc maize the cereals of europe potatoes and quinoa have continued to be at different heights above the level of the sea the basis of continental agriculture within the tropics indigo cotton coffee and sugar-cane appear in those regions only in intercalated groups cuba and the other islands of the archipelago of the antilles presented during the space of two centuries and a half a uniform aspect the same plants were cultivated which had nourished the half-wild natives and the vast savannas of the great islands were peopled with numerous herds of cattle piedra de atienza planted the first sugar canes in st domingo about the year fifteen twenty and cylindrical presses moved by water wheels were constructed note on the trapiche or molinos de agua of the sixteenth century see oviedo hist nat des ind lib four cap eight end of note but the island of cuba participated little in these efforts of rising industry and what is very remarkable in fifteen fifty three the historians of the conquest mention no exportation of sugar except that of mexican sugar for spain and peru note lopez de gomara conquista de mexico medina del campo one three five three fall one twenty nine end of note far from throwing into commerce what we now call colonial produce the havana till the eighteenth century exported only skins and leather the rearing of cattle was succeeded by the cultivation of tobacco and the rearing of bees of which the first hives colmenares were brought from the floridas wax and tobacco soon became more important objects of commerce than leather but were shortly superseded in their turn by the sugar-cane and coffee the cultivation of these productions did not exclude more ancient cultivation and in the different phases of agricultural industry notwithstanding the general tendency to make the coffee plantations predominate the sugar-houses furnish the greatest amount in the annual profits the exportation of tobacco coffee sugar and wax by lawful and illicit means amounts to fourteen millions of piastres according to the actual price of those articles three qualities of sugar are distinguished in the island of cuba 
according to the degree of purity attained by refining grados de purga in every loaf or reversed cone the upper part yields the white sugar the middle part the yellow sugar or quebrado and the lower part or point of the cone the cucurucho all the sugar of cuba is consequently refined a very small quantity is introduced of coarse or muscovado sugar by corruption azucar muscabado the forms being of a different size the loaves honeys differ also in weight they generally weigh an aroba after refining the refiners maestros de azucar endeavour to make every loaf of sugar yield five ninths of white three ninths of quebrado and one ninth of cucurucho the price of white sugar is higher when sold alone than in the sale called surtido in which three-fifths of white sugar and two-fifths of quebrado are combined in the same lot in the latter case the difference of the price is generally four reals reals de plata in the former it rises to six or seven reals the revolution of saint domingo the prohibitions dictated by the continental system of napoleon the enormous consumption of sugar in england and the united states the progress of cultivation in cuba brazil demerara the mauritius and java have occasioned great fluctuations of price and in an interval of twelve years it was from three to seven reals in eighteen o seven and from twenty four to twenty eight reals in eighteen eighteen which proves fluctuations in the relation of one to five during my stay in the plains of guinness in 1804 i endeavoured to obtain some accurate information respecting the statistics of the making of sugar-cane a great ingenio producing from thirty two thousand to forty thousand arrobas of sugar is generally fifty caballerias or six hundred and fifty hectares in extent of which the half less than one-tenth of a square sea league is allotted to sugar-making properly so called canaveral and the other half for alimentary plants and pasturage potrero note the agrarian measure called caballeria is eighteen cordels each cordel includes twenty-four varas or four hundred and thirty-two square varas consequently as one vara equals point eight three five meters according to rodriguez a caballeria is one hundred and eighty six thousand six hundred and twenty four square varas or one hundred and thirty thousand one hundred and eighteen square meters or thirty two and two tenths english acres end of note the price of land varies naturally according to the quality of the soil and the proximity of the ports of the havana matanzas and mariel in a circuit of twenty-five leagues round the havana the caballeria may be estimated at two or three thousand piastres for a produce of thirty-two thousand arrobas or two thousand cases of sugar the ingenio must have at least three hundred negroes Note. there are very few plantations in the whole island of cuba capable of furnishing forty thousand arrobas among these few are the ingenio of rio blanco or of the marques del arca and those belonging to don rafael ofarel and doña felicia Harurigi. sugar houses are thought to be very considerable they yield two thousand cases annually or thirty two thousand arrobas nearly three hundred and sixty eight thousand kilograms in the french colonies it is generally computed that the third or fourth part only of the land is allotted for the plantation of food bananas ignames and batatas in the spanish colonies a greater surface is lost in pasturage this is the natural consequence of the old habits of the haciendos de ganado end of note an adult and acclimated slave is worth from four hundred and fifty to five hundred piastres a bozal negro adult not acclimated three hundred and seventy to four hundred piastres it is probable that a negro costs annually in nourishment clothing and medicine forty-five to fifty piastres consequently with the interest of the capital and deducting the holidays more than twenty-two sous per day the slaves are fed with tasajo meat dried in the sun of buenos aires and caracas salt fish bacalao when the tasajo is too dear and vegetables viandas such as pumpkins munatos batatas and maize an arroba of tasajo was worth ten to twelve reals at guinness in 1804 and from fourteen to sixteen in 1825 an ingenio such as we here suppose with the produce of thirty two thousand to forty thousand arrobas requires first three machines with cylinders put in motion by oxen trapiche or two water wheels second according to the old spanish method which by a slow fire causes a great consumption of wood eighteen cauldrons piezas 
according to the first method of reverberation introduced since the year 1801 by Monsieur Bailly of St. Domingo, under the auspices of Don Nicolas Calvo, three clarificadores, three pilas, and two trainas de tachos, each train has three piezas, in all twelve fondos. It is commonly asserted that three arrobas of refined sugar yield one barrel of meal, and that the molasses are sufficient for the expenses of the plantation. This is especially the case where they produce brandy in abundance. 32,000 arrobas of sugar yield 15,000 barrios de meal at two arrobas, of which 500 pipas de aguardiente de caña are made at 25 piastras. In establishing an ingenio capable of furnishing 2,000 cajas yearly, a capitalist would draw, according to the old Spanish method, and at the present price of sugar, an interest of six and one-sixth per cent, an interest no way considerable for an establishment not merely agricultural, and of which the expense remains the same, although the produce sometimes diminishes more than a third. It is very rarely that one of those great ingenios can make 32,000 cases of sugar during several successive years. It cannot therefore be a matter of surprise that when the price of sugar in the island of Cuba has been very low, four or five piastres the quintal, the cultivation of rice has been preferred to that of sugar cane. The profit of the old landowners, haciendados, consists first in the circumstance that the expenses of the settlement were much less twenty or thirty years ago, when a caballeria of good land cost only twelve hundred or sixteen hundred piastres, instead of two and a half thousand to three and a half thousand, and the adult negro three hundred piastres, instead of four hundred and fifty to five hundred, second in the balance of the very low and the very high prices of sugar. These prices are so different in a period of ten years that the interest of the capital varies from five to fifteen per cent. In the year 1804, for instance, if the capital employed had been only one hundred thousand piastres, the raw produce, according to the value of sugar and rum, would have amounted to ninety-four thousand piastres. Now, from 1797 to 1800, the price of a case of sugar was sometimes, mean value, 40 piastres, instead of 24, which I was obliged to suppose in the calculation for the year 1825. When a sugar house, a great manufacturer, or a mine, is found in the hands of the person who first formed the establishment, the estimate of the rate of interest which the capital employed yields to the proprietor can be no guide to those who, purchasing afterwards, balance the advantages of different kinds of industry. In soils that can be watered, or where plants with tuberose roots have preceded the cultivation of the sugar cane, a caballeria of fertile land yields, instead of 1,500 arrobas, 3,000 or 4,000, making 2,660 or 3,340 kilograms of sugar, blanco and quebrado, per hectare, in fixing on 1,500 arrobas and estimating the case of sugar at 24 piastres, according to the price of the Havana, we find that the hectare produces the value of 870 francs in sugar and that of 288 francs in wheat, in the supposition of an octuple harvest, and the price of 100 kilograms of wheat being 18 francs. I have observed elsewhere that in this comparison of the two branches of cultivation, it must not be forgotten that the cultivation of sugar requires great capital, for instance, at present, 400,000 piastres for an annual production of 32,000 arrobas, or 368,000 kilograms, if this quantity be made in one single settlement. At Bengal, in watered lands, an acre, 4,044 square meters, renders 2,300 kilograms of coarse sugar, making 5,700 kilograms per hectare. If this fertility is common in lands of great extent, we must not be surprised at the low price of sugar in the East Indies. The produce of a hectare is double that of the best soil in the West Indies, and the price of a free Indian day laborer is not one-third the price of the day labor of a negro slave in the island of Cuba. In Jamaica, in 1825, a plantation of 500 acres, or 15 and a half caballerias, of which 200 acres are cultivated in sugar cane, yields, by the labor of 200 slaves, 100 oxen and 50 mules, 2,800 hundredweight, or 142,200 kilograms of sugar, and is computed to be worth, with its slaves, 43,000 pounds sterling. According to this estimate of Mr. Stewart, 
one hectare would yield one thousand seven hundred and sixty kilograms of coarse sugar for such is the quality of the sugar furnished for commerce at jamaica reckoning in a great sugar fabric of the havana twenty five caballerias or three hundred and twenty five hectares for a produce of from thirty two thousand to forty thousand cases we find one thousand one hundred and thirty or one thousand four hundred and twenty kilograms of refined sugar blanco and quebrado per hectare this result agrees sufficiently with that of jamaica if we consider the loss sustained in the weight of sugar by refining in converting the coarse sugar into azúcar blanco y quebrado or refined sugar at san domingo a square three thousand four hundred and three square toises equals one point two nine hectares is estimated at forty and sometimes sixty quintals if we fix on five thousand pounds we still find one thousand nine hundred kilograms of coarse sugar per hectare supposing as we ought to do when speaking of the produce of the whole island of cuba that in soils of average fertility the caballeria at thirteen hectares yields one thousand five hundred arrobas of refined sugar mixed with blanco and quebrada or one thousand three hundred and thirty kilograms per hectare it follows that sixty thousand eight hundred and seventy two hectares or nineteen four fifths square sea leagues nearly a ninth of the extent of a department of france of middling size suffice to produce the four hundred and forty thousand cases of refined sugar furnished by the island of cuba for its own consumption and for lawful and illicit exportation it seems surprising that less than twenty square sea leagues should yield an annual produce of more than the value of fifty-two millions of francs counting one case at the havana at the rate of twenty-four piastres to furnish coarse sugar for the consumption of thirty millions of french which is actually from fifty-six to sixty millions of kilograms it requires within the tropics but nine and five-sixths square sea leagues cultivated with sugar-cane and in temperate climates but thirty-seven and a half square sea leagues cultivated with beetroot a hectare of good soil sown or planted with beetroot produces in france from ten to thirty thousand kilograms of beetroot the mean fertility is twenty thousand kilograms which furnish two and a half per cent or five hundred kilograms of coarse sugar now one hundred kilograms of that sugar yield fifty kilograms of refined sugar thirty of sugar bourgeoise and twenty of muscovade consequently a hectare of beetroot produces two hundred and fifty kilograms of refined sugar a short time before my arrival at the havana there had been sent from germany some specimens of beetroot sugar which were said to menace the existence of the sugar islands in america the planters had learned with alarm that it was a substance entirely similar to sugar-cane but they flattered themselves that the high price of labor in europe and the difficulty of separating the sugar fit for crystallization from so great a mass of vegetable pulp would render the operation on a grand scale little profitable chemistry has since that period succeeded in overcoming those difficulties and in the year eighteen twelve france alone had more than two hundred beetroot sugar factories working with very unequal success and producing a million of kilograms of coarse sugar that is a fifty-eighth part of the actual consumption of sugar in france those two hundred factories are now reduced to fifteen or twenty which yield a produce of three hundred thousand kilograms note although the actual price of sugar-cane not refined is one franc fifty cents in the kilogram in the ports the production of beetroot sugar offers a still greater advantage in certain localities for instance in the vicinity of arras these establishments would be introduced in many other parts of france if the price of the sugar of the west indies rose to two francs or two francs twenty-five cents the kilogram and if the government laid no tax on the beetroot sugar to compensate the loss on the consumption of colonial sugar the making of beetroot sugar is especially profitable when combined with a general system of rural economy with the improvement of the soil and the nourishment of cattle it is not a cultivation independent of local circumstances like that of the sugar cane in the tropics End of note. the inhabitants of the west indies well informed of the affairs of europe no longer fear beetroot grapes chestnuts and mushrooms the coffee of naples nor the indigo of the south of france fortunately the improvement of the condition of the west india slaves does not depend on the success of these branches of european cultivation previously to the year seventeen sixty two the island of cuba did not furnish more commercial produce 
than their three least industrious and most neglected provinces with respect to cultivation veragua the isthmus of panama and darien do at present a political event which appeared extremely unfortunate the taking of the havana by the english roused the public mind the town was evacuated in seventeen eighty four and its subsequent efforts of industry date from that memorable period the construction of new fortifications on a gigantic plan threw a great deal of money suddenly into circulation note it is affirmed that the construction of the fort of cabana alone cost fourteen millions of piastres end of note later the slave trade became free and furnished hands for the sugar factories free trade with all the ports of spain and occasionally with neutral states the able administration of don luis de las casas the establishment of the consulado and the patriotic society the destruction of the french colony of saint domingo note in three successive attempts in august seventeen ninety one june seventeen ninety three and october eighteen o three above all the unfortunate and sanguinary expedition of generals leclerc and rochambeau completed the destruction of the sugar factories of saint domingo end of note and the rise in the price of sugar which was the natural consequence the improvement in machines and ovens due in great part to the refugees of cape francois the more intimate connection formed between the proprietors of the sugar factories and the merchants of the havana the great capital employed by the latter in agricultural establishments sugar and coffee plantations such have been successively the causes of the increasing prosperity of the island of cuba notwithstanding the conflict of the authorities which serves to embarrass the progress of affairs the greatest changes in the plantations of sugar-cane and in the sugar factories took place from seventeen ninety six to eighteen hundred first mules were substituted trapiche de mulas for oxen trapiche de bueyes and afterwards hydraulic wheels were introduced trapiche de agua which the first conquistadors had employed at saint domingo finally the action of steam engines was tried at Cibabo, at the expense of Count Haruko y Mopes. There are now twenty five of those machines in the different sugar mills in the island of Cuba. The culture of the sugar cane of Otaheite in the meantime increased. Boilers of preparation, clarificadoras, were introduced, and the reverberating furnaces better arranged. It must be said to the honor of wealthy proprietors that in a great number of plantations, a kind of solicitude is manifested for sick slaves for the introduction of negresses and for the education of children the number of sugar-cane factories ingenios in seventeen seventy five was four hundred and seventy three in the whole island and in eighteen seventeen more than seven hundred and eighty among the former none produced the fourth part of the sugar now made in the ingenios of second rank it is consequently not the number of factories that can afford an accurate idea of the progress of that branch of agricultural industry. The first sugar canes carefully planted on virgin soil yield a harvest during twenty to twenty-five years, after which they must be replanted every three years. There existed in 1804 at the Hacienda de Matamoros a square, Canavaral, worked during forty-five years. The most fertile soil for the production of sugar is now in the vicinity of mariel and Wanahe. that variety of sugar cane known by the name of cana de otahiti recognized at a distance by a fresher green has the advantage of furnishing on the same extent of soil one-fourth more juice and a stem more woody thicker and consequently richer in combustible matter the refiners maestros de azucar pretend that the bijou guarapo of the cana de otahiti is more easily worked and yields more crystallized sugar by adding less lime or potass to the verzu. The South Sea sugar cane furnishes no doubt, after five or six years' cultivation, the thinnest stubble, but the knots remain more distant from each other than in the cana creolia or de la tierra. The apprehension at first entertained of the former degenerating by degrees into ordinary sugar cane is happily not realized. The sugar cane is planted in the island of Cuba in the rainy season, from July to October, and the harvest is gathered from February to May. In proportion as by too rapid clearing the island has become unwooded, the sugar houses have begun to want fuel. A little stalk, sugar cane destitute of its juice, used to be employed to quicken the fire beneath the old cauldrons, tachos. But it is only since the introduction of reverberating furnaces by the emigrants of St. Domingo 
that the attempt has been made to dispense altogether with wood and burn only refuse sugar cane in the old construction of furnaces and cauldrons a taria of wood of one hundred and sixty cubic feet is burnt to produce five arobas of sugar or for a hundred kilograms of raw sugar two hundred and seventy eight cubic feet of the wood of the lemon and orange trees are required in the reverberating furnaces of st domingo a cart of refuse cane of four hundred and ninety five cubic feet produced six hundred and forty pounds of coarse sugar which make one hundred and fifty eight cubic feet of refuse cane for one hundred kilograms of sugar i attempted during my stay at guinness and especially at rio blanco with the count de mopes several new constructions with a view of diminishing the expense of fuel surrounding the focus with substances which do not powerfully conduct the heat and thus diminish the sufferings of the slaves who keep up the fire a long residence in the salt producing districts of europe and the labours of practical halergy to which i have been devoted since my early youth suggested to me the idea of those constructions which have been imitated with some success couvercles of wood placed on clarificadoras accelerated the evaporation and led me to believe that a system of cuvercles and movable frames furnished with counterweights might extend to other cauldrons this object merits further examination but the quantity of vejou guarapo of the crystallized sugar extracted and that which is destroyed the fuel the time and the pecuniary expense must be carefully estimated an error very general throughout europe and one which influences opinion respecting the effects of the abolition of the slave trade is that in those west india islands called sugar colonies the majority of the slaves are supposed to be employed in the production of sugar the cultivation of the sugar cane is no doubt a powerful incentive to the activity of the slave trade but a very simple calculation suffices to prove that the total mass of slaves contained in the west indies is nearly three times greater than the number employed in the production of sugar i showed seven years ago that if the two hundred thousand cases of sugar exported from the island of cuba in 1812 were produced in the great establishments less than thirty thousand slaves would have sufficed for that kind of labor it ought to be borne in mind for the interest of humanity that the evils of slavery weigh on a much greater number of individuals than agricultural labors require even admitting which i am very far from doing that sugar coffee indigo and cotton can be cultivated only by slaves at the island of cuba it is generally supposed that one hundred and fifty negroes are required to produce one thousand cases one hundred and eighty four thousand kilograms of refined sugar or in round numbers a little more than one thousand two hundred kilograms by the labor of each adult slave the production of four hundred and forty thousand cases would consequently require only sixty six thousand slaves if we add thirty six thousand to that number for the cultivation of coffee and tobacco in the island of cuba we find that about one hundred thousand of the two hundred and sixty thousand slaves now there would suffice for the three branches of colonial industry on which the activity of commerce depends End of chapter three point thirty one part three chapter three point thirty one part four of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point thirty one part four coffee the cultivation of coffee takes its date like the improved construction of cauldrons in the sugar-houses from the arrival of the emigrants of san domingo especially after the years seventeen ninety six and seventeen ninety eight a hectare yields three hundred and sixty kilograms the produce of three thousand five hundred plants the province of havana reckoned in eighteen hundred sixty cafetales in eighteen seventeen seven hundred and seventy nine cafetales the coffee tree being a shrub that yields a good harvest only in the fourth year the exportation of coffee from the port of the havana was in eighteen o four only fifty thousand arrobas it rose in eighteen o nine to three hundred and twenty thousand arrobas in eighteen fifteen to nine hundred and eighteen thousand two hundred and sixty three arrobas in eighteen fifteen when the price of coffee was fifteen piastres the quintal 
the value of the exportation from the Havana exceeded the sum of three million four hundred and forty three thousand piastres. In 1823, the exportation from the port of Matanzas was eighty four thousand four hundred and forty arrobas, so that it seems not doubtful that, in years of medium fertility, the total exportation of the island, lawful and contraband, is more than fourteen millions of kilograms. From this calculation, it results that the exportation of coffee from the island of Cuba is greater than that from Java, estimated by Mr. Crawford in 1820 at 190,000 picoles, 11 and four-fifths millions of kilograms. It likewise exceeds the exportation from Jamaica, which amounted in 1823, according to the registers of the Custom House, only to 169,734 hundredweight, or eight million six hundred and twenty two thousand four hundred and seventy eight kilograms in the same year great britain received from all the english islands one hundred and ninety four thousand eight hundred and twenty eight hundredweight or nine million eight hundred and ninety six thousand eight hundred and fifty six kilograms which proves that jamaica only produced six sevenths guadeloupe sent in eighteen ten to the mother country one million seventeen thousand one hundred and ninety kilograms Martinico, six hundred and seventy one thousand three hundred and thirty six kilograms. At Haiti, where the production of coffee before the French Revolution was thirty seven million two hundred and forty thousand kilograms, Port au Prince exported in eighteen twenty four only ninety one million five hundred and forty four thousand kilograms. It appears that the total exportation of coffee from the archipelago of the West Indies, by lawful means only, now amounts to more than thirty-eight millions of kilograms, nearly five times the consumption of France, which, from 1820 to 1823, was, on the yearly average, 8,198,000 kilograms. The consumption of Great Britain is yet only three and one-half millions of kilograms. Note, before the year 1807, when the tax on coffee was reduced, the consumption of Great Britain was not 8,000 hundredweight, less than one-half million of kilograms. In 1809, it rose to 45,071 hundredweights. In 1810, to 49,147 hundredweight. In 1823, to 71,000 hundredweight. In 1824, to 66,000 hundredweight, or 3,552,800 kilograms. End of note. The exportation of 1814 was 60 and one half millions of kilograms which we may suppose was at that period nearly the consumption of the whole of Europe. Great Britain, taking that denomination in its true sense as denoting only England and Scotland, now consumes nearly two-thirds less coffee and three times more sugar than France. The price of sugar at the Havana is always by the arroba of 25 Spanish pounds, or 11.49 kilograms, and the price of coffee by the quintal, or 45.97 kilograms. The latter has been known to vary from 40 to 30 piastres. It even fell in 1808, before 24 reals. The price in 1815 and 1819 was between 13 and 17 piastres the quintal. Coffee is now at 12 piastres. It is probable that the cultivation of coffee scarcely employs, in the whole island of Cuba, 28,000 slaves, who produce, on the yearly average, 305,000 Spanish quintals, fourteen millions of kilograms, or according to the present value three million six hundred and sixty thousand piastres, while sixty six thousand negroes produce four hundred and forty thousand cases, eighteen millions of kilograms of sugar, which at the price of twenty four piastres is worth ten million five hundred and sixty thousand piastres. It results from this calculation that a slave now produces the value of one hundred and thirty piastres of coffee and one hundred and sixty piastres of sugar. It is almost useless to observe that these relations vary with the price of the two articles, of which the variations are often opposite, and that, in calculations which may throw some light on agriculture in the tropical region, I comprehend in the same point of view interior consumption, exportation, lawful and contraband. Tobacco. The tobacco of the island of Cuba is celebrated throughout Europe. The custom of smoking, borrowed from the natives of Haiti, was introduced into Europe about the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. It was generally hoped that the cultivation of tobacco, freed from an oppressive monopoly, 
would be to the havana a very profitable object of commerce the good intentions displayed by the government in abolishing within six years the factoria de tapacos have not been attended by the improvement which was expected in that branch of industry the cultivators want capital the farms have become extremely dear and the predilection for the cultivation of coffee is prejudicial to that of tobacco the oldest information we possess respecting the quantity of tobacco which the island of cuba has thrown into the magazines of the mother country go back to seventeen forty eight according to the abbe Reynal, a much more exact writer than is generally believed that quantity from seventeen forty eight to seventeen fifty three average year was seventy five thousand arrobas from seventeen eighty nine to seventeen ninety four the produce of the island amounted annually to two hundred and fifty thousand arrobas but from that period to eighteen o three the increased price of land the attention given exclusively to the coffee plantations and the sugar factories little vexations in the exercise of the royal monopoly estanco and impediments in the way of export trade have progressively diminished the produce by more than one half the total produce of tobacco in the island is however believed to have been from eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty five again from three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand arrobas in good years when the harvest rose to three hundred and fifty thousand arrobas of leaves one hundred and twenty eight thousand arrobas were prepared for the peninsula eighty thousand for the havana nine thousand two hundred for peru six thousand for panama three thousand for buenos aires two thousand two hundred and forty for mexico and one thousand for caracas and campeche to complete the sum of three hundred and fifteen million for the harvest loses ten per cent of its weight in merma y Iberias during the preparation and the transport we must suppose that eighty thousand arrobas were consumed in the interior of the island on los campos whither the monopoly and the taxes did not extend the maintenance of one hundred and twenty slaves and the expense of the manufacture amounted only to twelve thousand piastres annually the persons employed in the factoria cost fifty four thousand one hundred piastres the value of one hundred and twenty eight thousand arrobas which in good years was sent to spain either in cigars or in snuff rama y polvos often exceeded five million piastres according to the common price of spain it seems surprising to see that the statements of exportation from the havana documents published by the consulado mark the exportations for eighteen sixteen at only three thousand four hundred arrobas for eighteen twenty three only thirteen thousand nine hundred arrobas of tobacco on rama and seventy one thousand pounds of tobacco torcida estimated together at the custom house at two hundred and eighty one thousand piastres for eighteen twenty five only seventy thousand three hundred and two pounds of cigars and one hundred sixty seven thousand one hundred pounds of tobacco in leaves but it must be remembered that no branch of contraband is more active than that of cigars although the tobacco of the vuelta de abajo is the most famous a considerable exportation takes place in the eastern part of the island i rather doubt the total exportation of two hundred thousand boxes of cigars value two million piastres as stated by several travellers during latter years if the harvests were thus abundant why should the island of cuba receive tobacco from the united states for the consumption of the lower class of people i shall say nothing of the cotton the indigo or the wheat of the island of cuba these branches of colonial industry are of comparatively little importance and the proximity of the united states and guatemala renders competition almost impossible the state of salvador belonging to the confederation of central america now throws twelve thousand tercios annually or one million eight hundred thousand pounds of indigo into trade an exportation which amounts to more than two million piastres the cultivation of wheat succeeds to the great astonishment of travellers who have passed through mexico near the cuatro vias at small heights above the level of the ocean though in general it is very limited the flour is fine but colonial productions are more tempting and the plains of the united states that crimea of the new world yields harvests too abundant for the commerce of native cereals to be efficaciously protected by the prohibitive system of the custom-house in an island near the mouth of the mississippi and the delaware 
analogous difficulties oppose the cultivation of flax hemp and the vine possibly the inhabitants of cuba are themselves ignorant of the fact that in the first years of the conquest by the spaniards wine was made in their island of wild grapes Note. De muchas paras montesas con ubas se he cogido vino, aunque algo agrio. From several great bearing vines which grow in the mountains, they extract a kind of wine, but it is very acid. Herrera, Deck 1, page 233. Gabriel de Cabrera found a tradition at Cuba similar to that which the people of Semitic race have of Noah, experiencing for the first time the effect of a fermented liquor. He adds that the idea of two races of men, one naked, another clothed, is linked to the American tradition. Has Cabrera, preoccupied by the rites of the Hebrews, imperfectly interpreted the words of the natives, or, as seems more probable, has he added something to the analogies of the woman serpent, the conflict of two brothers, the cataclysm of water, the raft of Coco? the exploring bird and many other things that teach us incontestably that there existed a community of antique traditions between the nations of two worlds views of the cordilleras and monuments of america End of note. this kind of vine peculiar to america has given rise to the general error that the true vitus vinifera is common to the two continents the paras montesas which yields the somewhat sour wine of the island of cuba was probably gathered on the vitus tiliofolia, which Mr. Vildenau has described from our herbals. In no part of the northern hemisphere has the vine hitherto been cultivated with the view of producing wine south of the 27 degrees 48 minutes, or the latitude of the island of Faro, one of the Canaries, and of 29 degrees 2 minutes, or the latitude of Bushir in Persia. Wax. This is not the produce of native bees, the millipones of Latraille, but of bees brought from Europe by way of Florida. The trade in wax has only become important since 1772. The exportation of the whole island, which from 1774 to 1779 was only 2,700 arrobas average year, was estimated in 1803, including contraband, at 42,700 arrobas, of which 25,000 were destined for Veracruz. In the churches of Mexico, there is great consumption of Cuban wax. The price varies from 16 to 20 piastres the arroba. Trinidad and the small port of Baracoa also carry on a considerable trade in wax, furnished by the almost uncultivated regions on the east of the island. In the proximity of the sugar factories, many bees perish of inebriety from the molasses, of which they are extremely fond. In general, the production of wax diminishes in proportion as the cultivation of the land augments. The exportation of wax, according to the present price, amounts to about five hundred thousands of piastres. Commerce. It has already been observed that the importance of the commerce of the island of Cuba depends not solely on the riches of its productions, the wants of the population in the articles and merchandise of Europe, but also in great part on the favourable position of the port of the Havana. This port is situated at the entrance of the Gulf of Mexico, where the high roads of the commercial nations of the Old and the New Worlds cross each other. It was remarked by the Abbe Reynal, at a period when agriculture and industry were in their infancy, and scarcely threw into commerce the value of two million piastres in sugar and tobacco, that the island of Cuba alone might be worth a kingdom to Spain. There seems to have been something prophetic in those memorable words, and since the parent state has lost Mexico, Peru, and so many other colonies declared independent, they demand the serious consideration of statesmen who are called upon to discuss the political interests of the peninsula. The island of Cuba, to which for a long time the court of Madrid wisely granted great freedom of trade, exports, lawful and by contraband, of its own native productions, in sugar, coffee, tobacco, wax, and skins, to the value of more than 14 million piastres, which is about one-third less than the value of the precious metals furnished by Mexico at the period of the greatest prosperity of its mines. Note. In 1805, gold and silver specie was struck at Mexico to the value of 27,165,888 piastres, but, taking an average of ten years of political tranquillity, 
we find from eighteen hundred to eighteen ten scarcely twenty four and one half million of piastres end of note it may be said that the havana and vera cruz are to the rest of america what new york is to the united states the tonnage of one thousand to twelve hundred merchant ships which annually enter the port of the havana amounts excluding the small coasting vessels to one hundred and fifty thousand to one hundred and seventy thousand tons note in eighteen sixteen the tonnage of the commerce of new york was two hundred and ninety nine thousand six hundred and seventeen tons that of boston one hundred and forty three thousand four hundred and twenty tons the amount of tonnage is not always an exact measure of the wealth of commerce the countries which export rice flour hewn wood and cotton require more capaciousness than the tropical regions of which the productions cochineal indigo sugar and coffee are of little bulk although of considerable value End of note. in time of peace from one hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty ships of war are frequently seen at anchor at the havana from eighteen fifteen to eighteen nineteen the productions registered at the custom house of that port only sugar rum molasses coffee wax and butter amounted on the average to the value of eleven million two hundred and forty five thousand piastres per annum in eighteen twenty three the exportation registered two-thirds less than their actual price amounted deducting one million one hundred and seventy nine thousand piastres in specie to more than twelve million five hundred thousand piastres it is probable that the exportation of the whole island lawful and contraband estimated at the real price of the articles the merchandise and the slaves amounted at present to fifteen million or sixteen million piastres of which scarcely three million or four million are re-exported the havana purchases from abroad far beyond its own wants and exchanges its colonial articles for the productions of the manufacturers of europe to sell a part of them at vera cruz trujillo guayra and cartagena on comparing in the commercial tables of the havana the great value of merchandise imported with a little value of merchandise re-exported one is surprised at the vast internal consumption of a country containing only three hundred and twenty five thousand whites and one hundred and thirty thousand free men of colour we find in estimating the different articles according to the real current prices in cotton and linen bretanas platillas lienzos y hilo two and a half to three millions of piastres in tissues of cotton zarazas musulinas one million of piastres in silk rasos y generos de seda four hundred thousand piastres and in linen and woolen tissues two hundred and twenty thousand piastres the wants of the island in european tissues registered as exported to the port of the havana only consequently exceeded in these latter years from four millions to four and a half millions of piastres to these importations of the havana we must add hardware and furniture more than half a million of piastres iron and steel three hundred and eighty thousand piastres planks and great timber four hundred thousand piastres castile soap three hundred thousand piastres with respect to the importation of provisions and drinks to the havana it appears to me to be well worthy the attention of those who would know the real state of those societies which are called sugar or slave colonies such is the composition of those societies established on the most fruitful soil which nature can furnish for the nourishment of man such the direction of agricultural labours and industry in the west indies that in the best climate of the equinoctial region the population would want subsistence but for the freedom and activity of external commerce i do not speak of the introduction of wines at the port of the havana which amounted according to the registers of the custom house in eighteen o three to forty thousand barrels in eighteen twenty three to fifteen thousand pipas and seventeen thousand barrels to the value of one million two hundred thousand piastres nor of the introduction of six thousand barrels of brandy from spain and holland and one hundred and thirteen thousand barrels one million eight hundred and sixty four thousand piastres of flour these wines liquors and flour are consumed by the opulent part of the nation the cereals of the united states have become articles of absolute necessity in a zone where maize manioc and bananas were long preferred to every other amylaceous food the development of a luxury altogether european cannot be complained of amidst the prosperity and increasing civilization of the havana but along with the introduction of the flour wine and spiritous liquors of europe we find 
in the year 1816, one and a half millions of piastres, and in the year 1823, three and a half millions for salt meat, rice, and dried vegetables. In the last mentioned year, the importation of rice was 323,000 arrobas, in the importation of dried and salt meat, tasajo, for the slaves, 465,000 arrobas. The scarcity of necessary articles of subsistence characterizes a part of the tropical climates where the imprudent activity of Europeans has inverted the order of nature. It will diminish in proportion as the inhabitants, more enlightened respecting their true interests, and discouraged by the low price of colonial produce, will vary the cultivation and give free scope to all the branches of rural economy. The principles of that narrow policy, which guides the government of very small islands, inhabited by men who desert the soil whenever they are sufficiently enriched, cannot be applicable to a country of an extent nearly equal to that of England, covered with populous cities, and where the inhabitants, established from father to son during ages, far from regarding themselves as strangers to the American soil, cherish it as their own country. The population of the island of Cuba which in fifty years will perhaps exceed a million, may open by its own consumption an immense field to native industry. If the slave trade should cease altogether, the slaves will pass by degrees into the class of free men, and society, being constructed without suffering any of the violent convulsions of civil dissension, will follow the path which nature has traced for all societies that become numerous and enlightened. The cultivation of the sugar cane and of coffee will not be abandoned, but it will no longer remain the principal basis of national existence than the cultivation of cochineal in Mexico, of indigo in Guatemala, and of cacao in Venezuela. A free, intelligent, and agricultural population will progressively succeed a slave population, destitute of foresight and industry. Already the capital which the commerce of the Havana has placed within the last twenty-five years in the hands of cultivators has begun to change the face of the country, and to that power of which the action is constantly increasing, another will be necessarily joined, inseparable from the progress of industry and national wealth, the development of human intelligence. On these united powers depend the future destinies of the metropolis of the West Indies. In reference to what has been said respecting external commerce, I may quote the author of a memoir which I have often mentioned, and who describes the real situation of the island. Quote, At the Havana, the effects of accumulated wealth begin to be felt. The price of provisions has been doubled in a small number of years. Labor is so dear that a bozal negro, recently brought from the coast of Africa, gains by the labor of his hands, without having learned any trade, from four to five reals, two francs thirteen sous to three francs five sous a day the negroes who follow mechanical trades however common gain from five to six francs the patrician families remain fixed to the soil a man who has enriched himself does not return to europe taking with him his capital some families are so opulent that don matteo de pedroso who died lately left in landed property above two millions of piastres Several commercial houses of the Havana purchase annually from ten to twelve thousand cases of sugar, for which they pay at the rate of from three hundred and fifty thousand to four hundred and twenty thousand piastres. End quote. De la situation présente de Cuba, in manuscript. Such was the state of public wealth at the end of eighteen hundred. Twenty-five years of increasing prosperity have elapsed since that period, and the population of the island is nearly doubled. The exportation of registered sugar had not, in any year before 1800, attained the extent of 170,000 cases, 31,280,000 kilograms. In these latter times it has constantly surpassed 200,000 cases, and even attained 250,000 and 300,000 cases, 46 to 55 millions of kilograms. A new branch of industry has sprung up, that of plantations of the coffee tree which furnishes an exportation of the value of three millions and a half of piastres. Industry, guided by a greater mass of knowledge, has been better directed. The system of taxation that weighed on national industry and exterior commerce has been made lighter since 1791, and been improved by successive changes. Whenever the mother country, mistaking her own interests, has attempted to make a retrograde step, 
courageous voices have arisen not only among the habaneros but often among the spanish rulers in defence of the freedom of american commerce a new channel has recently been opened for the capital by the enlightened zeal and patriotic views of the intendant don claudio martinez de pinillos and the commerce of entrepot has been granted to the havana on the most advantageous conditions the difficult and expensive interior communications of the island render its own productions dearer at the ports notwithstanding the short distance between the northern and southern coasts a project of canalization which unites the double advantage of connecting the havana and batabano by a navigable line and diminishing the high price of the transport of native produce merits here a special mention the idea of the canal of guinas has been conceived for more than half a century with the view of furnishing timber at a more moderate price for shipbuilding in the arsenal of the havana in 1796 the count de haruko y mopos an enterprising man who had acquired great influence by his connection with the prince of the peace undertook to revive this project the survey was made in 1798 by two very able engineers don francisco and don felice malamor these officers ascertained that the canal in its whole development would be nineteen leagues long five thousand varas or four thousand one hundred and fifty metres that the point of partition would be at the taverna del rey and that it would require nineteen locks on the north and twenty-one on the south the distance from the havana to batabano is only eight and a half sea leagues the canal of guinas would be very useful for the transport of agricultural productions by steamboats because its course would be in proximity with the best cultivated lands note steamboats are established from the havana to matanzas and from the havana to mariel the government granted to don juan o'farrell march twenty fourth eighteen nineteen a privilege on the barcos de vapor End of note. the roads are nowhere worse in the rainy season than in this part of the island where the soil is of friable limestone little fitted for the construction of solid roads the transport of sugar from guinas to the havana a distance of twelve leagues now costs one piastre per quintal besides the advantage of facilitating internal communications the canal would also give great importance to the surgidero of batabano into which small vessels laden with salt provisions tasajo from venezuela would enter without being obliged to double cape san antonio in the bad season and in time of war when corsairs are cruising between cape catoche tortugas and mariel the passage from the spanish main to the island of cuba would be shortened by entering not at the havana but at some port off of the southern coast the cost of constructing the canal de guinas was estimated in seventeen ninety six at one million or one million two hundred thousand piastres it is now thought that the expense would amount to more than one million and a half the productions which might annually pass the canal have been estimated at seventy five thousand cases of sugar twenty five thousand arrobas of coffee and eight thousand bocoyas of molasses and rum according to the first project that of seventeen ninety six it was intended to link the canal with a small river of guinas to be brought from the ingenio de la holanda to quibican three leagues south of bejual and santa rosa this idea is now relinquished the rio de los guinas losing its waters toward the east in the irrigation of the savannas of hato de guanamon instead of carrying the canal east of the barrio de cerro and south of the fort of atares in the bay of the havana it was proposed at first to make use of the bed of the torrera or rio armanderas from calabazal to Husillo, and then of the sanya real not only for conveying the boats to the centre of the arabales and of the city of the havana but also for furnishing water to the fountains which require to be supplied during three months of the year i visited several times with monsieur lamar the plains through which this line of navigation is intended to pass the utility of the project is incontestable if in times of great drought a sufficient quantity of water can be brought to the point of partition at the havana as in every place where commerce and the wealth it produces increase rapidly complaints are heard of the prejudicial influence exercised by them on ancient manners we cannot here stop to compare the first state of the island of cuba when covered with pasturage 
before the taking of the capital by the english and its present condition since it has become the metropolis of the west indies nor to throw into the balance the candour and simplicity of manners of an infant society against the manners that belong to the development of an advanced civilization the spirit of commerce leading to the love of wealth no doubt brings nations to depreciate what money cannot obtain but the state of human things is happily such that what is most desirable most noble most free in man is owing only to the inspirations of the soul to the extent and amelioration of its intellectual faculties were the thirst of riches to take absolute possession of every class of society it would infallibly produce the evil complained of by those who see with regret what they call the preponderance of the industrious system but the increase of commerce by multiplying the connections between nations by opening an immense sphere to the activity of the mind by pouring capital into agriculture and creating new wants by the refinement of luxury furnishes a remedy against the supposed dangers End of chapter three point thirty one part four chapter three point thirty one part five of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point thirty one part five finance the increase of the agricultural prosperity of the island of cuba and the influence of the accumulation of wealth on the value of importations have raised the public revenue in these latter years to four millions and a half perhaps five millions of piastres the custom house of the havana which before seventeen ninety four yielded less than six hundred thousand piastres and from seventeen ninety seven to eighteen hundred one million nine hundred thousand piastres pours into the treasury since the declaration of free trade a revenue in port liquido of more than three million one hundred thousand piastres note the custom house of port au prince at haiti produced in eighteen twenty five the sum of one million six hundred and fifty five thousand seven hundred and sixty four piastres that of buenos aires from eighteen nineteen to eighteen twenty one average year one million six hundred and fifty five thousand piastres see centinella de la plata september eighteen twenty two number eight argos de buenos aires number eighty five end of note the island of cuba as yet contains only one forty-second part of the population of france and one half of its inhabitants being in the most abject indigence consume but little its revenue is nearly equal to that of the republic of colombia and it exceeds the revenue of all the custom houses of the united states before the year seventeen ninety five when that confederation had four million five hundred thousand inhabitants while the island of cuba contained only seven hundred and fifteen thousand note the custom houses of the united states which yielded in eighteen o one to eighteen o eight sixteen millions of dollars produced in eighteen fifteen but seven million two hundred and eighty two thousand end of note the principal source of the public revenue of this fine colony is the custom house which alone produces above three-fifths and amply suffices for all the wants of the internal administration and military defence if in these latter years the expense of the general treasury of the havana amounted to more than four millions of piastres this increase of expense is solely owing to the obstinate struggle maintained between the mother country and her freed colonies two millions of piastres were employed to pay the land and sea forces which poured back from the american continent by the havana on their way to the peninsula as long as spain unmindful of her real interests refuses to recognize the independence of the new republics the island of cuba menaced by colombia and the mexican confederation must support a military force for its external defense which ruins the colonial finances the spanish naval force stationed in the port of the havana generally costs above six hundred and fifty thousand piastres the land forces require nearly one million and a half of piastres such a state of things cannot last indefinitely if the peninsula do not relieve the burden that presses upon the colony 
from seventeen eighty nine to seventeen ninety seven the produce of the custom house at the havana never rose to more than seven hundred thousand piastres in eighteen fourteen it was one million eight hundred and fifty five thousand one hundred and seventeen from eighteen fifteen to eighteen nineteen the royal taxes in the port of the havana amounted to eleven million five hundred and seventy five four hundred and sixty piastres total eighteen million two hundred and eighty four eight hundred and seven piastres or average year three million six hundred and fifty seven thousand piastres of which the municipal taxes formed zero point three six the public revenue of the administracion general de rentas of the jurisdiction of havana amounted in eighteen twenty to three million six hundred and thirty one thousand two hundred and seventy three piastres in eighteen twenty one to three million two hundred and seventy seven thousand six hundred and thirty nine piastres in eighteen twenty two to three million three hundred and seventy eight thousand two hundred and twenty eight piastres the royal and municipal taxes of importation at the custom house of the havana in eighteen twenty three were two million seven hundred and thirty four five hundred and sixty three piastres the total amount of the revenue of the havana in eighteen twenty four was three million twenty five thousand three hundred piastres in eighteen twenty five the revenue of the town and jurisdiction of the havana was three million three hundred and fifty thousand three hundred piastres these partial statements show that from seventeen eighty nine to eighteen twenty four the public revenue of cuba has been increased sevenfold according to the estimates of the cajas matrices the public revenue in eighteen twenty two was in the province of the havana alone four million three hundred and eleven thousand eight hundred and sixty two piastres which arose from the custom house three million one hundred and twenty seven thousand nine hundred and eighteen piastres from the ramos de directa entrada as lottery tithes etc six hundred and one thousand eight hundred and eight piastres and anticipations on the charges of the consulado and the deposito five hundred and eighty one thousand nine hundred and seventy eight piastres the expenditure in the same year for the island of cuba was two million seven hundred and thirty two thousand seven hundred and thirty eight piastres and for the succor destined to maintain the struggle with the continental colonies declared independent one million three hundred and sixty two thousand twenty nine piastres in the first class of expenditure we find one million three hundred and fifty five thousand seven hundred and ninety eight piastres for the subsistence of the military forces kept up for the defence of the havana and the neighbouring places and six hundred and forty eight thousand nine hundred and eight piastres for the royal navy stationed in the port of the havana in the second class of expense foreign to the local administration we find one million one hundred and fifteen thousand six hundred and seventy two piastres for the pay of four thousand two hundred and thirty four soldiers who after having evacuated mexico colombia and other parts of the continent formerly spanish possessions passed by the havana to return to spain one hundred and sixty four thousand piastres is the cost of the defence of the castle of san juan de ulloa i here terminate the political essay on the island of cuba in which i have traced the state of that important spanish possession as it now is my object has been to throw light on facts and give precision to ideas by the aid of comparisons and statistical tables that minute investigation of facts is desirable at a moment when on the one hand enthusiasm exciting to benevolent credulity and on the other animosities menacing the security of the new republics have given rise to the most vague and erroneous statements i have as far as possible abstained from all reasoning on future chances and on the probability of the changes which external politics may produce in the situation of the west indies i have merely examined what regards the organization of human society the unequal partition of rights and of the enjoyments of life the threatening dangers which the wisdom of the legislator and the moderation of free men may ward off whatever be the form of the government it is for the traveller who has been an eye-witness of the suffering and the degradation of human nature to make the complaints of the unfortunate reach the ear of those by whom they can be relieved 
i observed the condition of the blacks in countries where the laws the religion and the national habits tend to mitigate their fate yet i retained on quitting america the same horror of slavery which i had felt in europe in vain have writers of ability seeking to veil barbarous institutions by ingenious turns of language invented the expressions negro peasants of the west indies black vassalage and patriarchal protection that is profaning the noble qualities of the mind and the imagination for the purpose of exculpating by illusory comparisons or captious sophisms excesses which afflict humanity and which prepare the way for violent convulsions do they think that they have acquired the right of putting down commiseration by comparing the condition of the negroes with that of the serfs of the middle ages and with the state of oppression to which some classes are still subject in the north and east of europe Note. such comparisons do not satisfy those secret partisans of the slave trade who try to make light of the miseries of the black race and to resist every emotion those miseries awaken the permanent condition of a caste founded on barbarous laws and institutions is often confounded with the excesses of a power temporarily exercised on individuals thus mr bolingbroke who lived seven years at demerara and who visited the west india islands observes that quote, on board an english ship of war flogging is more frequent than in the plantations of the english colonies End quote. he adds quote, that in general the negroes are but little flogged but that very reasonable means of correction have been imagined such as making them take boiling soup strongly peppered or obliging them to drink with a very small spoon a solution of glauber salts quote. mr bolingbroke regards the slave trade as a universal benefit and he is persuaded that if negroes who have enjoyed during twenty years all the comforts of slave life at demerara were permitted to return to the coast of africa they would effect recruiting on a large scale and bring whole nations to the english possessions voyage to demerara 1807 such is the firm and frank profession of faith of a planter yet mr bolingbroke as several passages of his book prove is a moderate man full of benevolent intentions toward the slaves End of note. these comparisons these artifices of language this disdainful impatience with which even a hope of the gradual abolition of slavery is repulsed as chimerical are useless arms in the times in which we live the great revolutions which the continent of america and the archipelago of the west indies have undergone since the commencement of the nineteenth century have had their influence on public feeling and public reason even in countries where slavery exists and is beginning to be modified many sensible men deeply interested in the tranquillity of the sugar and slave islands feel that by a liberal understanding among the proprietors and by judicious measures adopted by those who know the localities they might emerge from a state of danger and uneasiness which indolence and obstinacy serve only to increase slavery is no doubt the greatest evil that afflicts human nature whether we consider the slave torn from his family in his native country and thrown into the hold of a slave ship or as making part of a flock of black men parked on the soil of the west indies but for the individuals there are degrees of suffering and privation note quote, if the slaves are whipped end quote, said one of the witnesses before the parliamentary committee of seventeen eighty nine to make them dance on the deck of a slave ship if they are forced to sing in chorus mesa mesa macarida how gaily we live among the whites this only proves the care we take of the health of those men End quote. this delicate attention reminds me of the description of an auto de fe in my possession in that curious document a boast is made of the prodigality with which refreshments are distributed to the condemned and of the staircase which the inquisitors have had erected in the interior of the pile for the accommodation of the relazados the released culprits End of note. how great is the difference in the condition of the slave who serves in the house of a rich family at the havana or at kingston or one who works for himself giving his master but a daily retribution and that of the slave attached to a sugar estate the threats employed to correct an obstinate negro mark this scale of human privations the coachman is menaced with a coffee plantation 
and the slave working on the latter is menaced with the sugar house the negro who with his wife inhabits a separate hut whose heart is warmed by those feelings of affection which for the most part characterize the african race finds that after his labor some care is taken of him amidst his indigent family is in a position not to be compared with that of the insulated slave lost in the mass this diversity of condition escapes the notice of those who have not had the spectacle of the west indies before their eyes owing to the progressive amelioration of the state even of the captive caste in the island of cuba the luxury of the masters and the possibility of gain by their work have drawn more than eighty thousand slaves to the towns and the manumission of them favoured by the wisdom of the laws is become so active as to have produced at the present period more than one hundred and thirty thousand free men of colour by considering the individual position of each class by recompensing by the decreasing scale of privations intelligence love of labour and the domestic virtues the colonial administration will find the best means of improving the condition of the blacks philanthropy does not consist in giving a little more salt fish and some fewer lashes the real amelioration of the captive caste ought to extend over the whole moral and physical position of man the impulse may be given by those european governments which have a right comprehension of human dignity and who know that whatever is unjust bears with it a germ of destruction but this impulse it is melancholy to add will be powerless if the union of the planters if the colonial assemblies or legislatures fail to adopt the same views and to act by a well-concerted plan having for its ultimate aim the cessation of slavery in the west indies till then it will be in vain to register the strokes of the whip to diminish the number that may be given at any one time to require the presence of witnesses and to appoint protectors of slaves all these regulations dictated by the most benevolent intentions are easily eluded the isolated position of the plantations renders their execution impossible they presuppose a system of domestic inquisition incompatible with what is understood in the colonies by the phrase established rights the state of slavery cannot be altogether peaceably ameliorated except by the simultaneous action of the free men white men and coloured residing in the west indies by colonial assemblies and legislatures by the influence of those who enjoying great moral consideration among their countrymen and acquainted with the localities know how to vary the means of improvement conformably with the manners habits and the position of every island in preparing the way for the accomplishment of this task which ought to embrace a great part of the archipelago of the west indies it may be useful to cast a retrospective glance on the events by which the freedom of a considerable part of the human race was obtained in europe in the middle ages in order to ameliorate without commotion new institutions must be made as it were to rise out of those which the barbarism of centuries has consecrated it will one day seem incredible that until the year eighteen twenty six there existed no law in the greater antilles to prevent the sale of young infants and their separation from their parents or to prohibit the degrading custom of marking the negroes with a hot iron merely to enable these human cattle to be more easily recognized enact laws to obviate the possibility of a barbarous outrage fix in every sugar estate the proportion between the least number of negresses and that of the laboring negroes grant liberty to every slave who has served fifteen years to every negress who has reared four or five children set them free on the condition of working a certain number of days for the profit of the plantation give the slaves a part of the net produce to interest them in the increase of agricultural riches fix a sum on the budget of the public funds destined for the ransom of slaves and the amelioration of their condition such are the most urgent objects for colonial legislation note general lafayette whose name is linked with all that promises to contribute to the liberty of man and the happiness of mankind conceived in the year seventeen eighty five the project of purchasing a settlement at cayenne and to divide it among the blacks by whom it was cultivated and in whose favour the proprietor renounced for himself and his descendants all benefit whatever he had interested in this noble enterprise the priests of the mission of the holy ghost 
who themselves possessed lands in French Guiana. A letter from Marshal de Castries, dated 6th June, 1785, proves that the unfortunate Louis the Sixteenth, extending his beneficent intentions to the blacks and free men of color, had ordered similar experiments to be made at the expense of the government. M. de Richepré, who was appointed by M. de Lafayette to superintend the partition of the lands among the blacks, died from the effects of the climate at Cayenne. End of note. The conquest on the continent of Spanish America and the slave trade in the West Indies, in Brazil, and in the southern parts of the United States, have brought together the most heterogeneous elements of population. This strange mixture of Indians, whites, negroes, mestizos, mulattoes, and zambos, is accompanied by all the perils which violent and disorderly passion can engender at those critical periods when society shaken to its very foundations begins a new era at those junctures the odious principle of the colonial system that of security founded on the hostility of castes and prepared during ages has burst forth with violence fortunately the number of blacks has been so inconsiderable in the new states of the spanish continent that with the exception of the cruelties exercised in venezuela where the royalist party armed their slaves the struggle between the independents and the soldiers of the mother country was not stained by the vengeance of the captive population the free men of color blacks mulattoes and mestizos have warmly espoused the national cause and the copper-colored race in its timid distrust and passiveness has taken no part in movements from which it must profit in spite of itself the indians long before the revolution were poor and free agriculturalists isolated by their language and manners they lived apart from the whites if in contempt of spanish laws the cupidity of the corregidors and the tormenting system of the missionaries often restricted their liberty that state of vexatious oppression was far different from personal slavery like that of the slavery of the blacks or of the vassalage of the peasantry and the sclavonian part of europe it is the small number of blacks it is the liberty of the aboriginal race of which america has preserved more than eight millions and a half without mixture of foreign blood that characterizes the ancient continental possessions of spain and renders their moral and political situation entirely different from that of the west indies where by the disproportion between the free men and the slaves the principles of the colonial system have been developed with more energy in the west indian archipelago as in brazil two portions of america which contain near three million two hundred thousand slaves the fear among the blacks and the perils that surround the whites have been hitherto the most powerful causes of the security of the mother countries and of the maintenance of the portuguese dynasty can this security from its nature be of long duration does it justify the inertness of governments who neglect to remedy the evil while it is yet time i doubt this when under the influence of extraordinary circumstances alarm is mitigated when countries in which the accumulation of slaves has produced in society the fatal mixture of heterogeneous elements may be led perhaps unwillingly into an exterior struggle civil dissensions will break forth in all their violence and european families innocent of an order of things which they have had no share in creating will be exposed to the most imminent dangers we can never sufficiently praise the legislative wisdom of the new republics of spanish america which since their birth have been seriously intent on the total extinction of slavery that vast portion of the earth has in this respect an immense advantage over the southern part of the united states where the whites during the struggle with england established liberty for their own profit and where the slave population to the number of one million six hundred thousand augments still more rapidly than the whites note in seventeen sixty nine forty-six years before the declaration of the congress at vienna and thirty-eight years before the abolition of the slave trade decreed in london and at washington the chamber of representatives of massachusetts had declared itself against quote, the unnatural and unwarrantable custom of enslaving mankind end quote. see walsh's appeal to the united states eighteen nineteen page three hundred and twelve the spanish writer avendano was perhaps the first who declaimed forcibly not only against the slave trade abhorred even by the afghans 
Elphinstone's Journey to Kabul, page 245, but against slavery in general and, quote, all the iniquitous sources of colonial wealth, end quote. Thesaurus, end tom, one, tit, nine, cap, two. End of note. If civilization, instead of extending, were to change its place, if after great and deplorable convulsions in Europe, America, between Cape Hatteras and the Missouri, were to become the principal seat of the light of Christianity, what a spectacle would be presented by that centre of civilization where, in the sanctuary of liberty, we could attend a sale of negroes after the death of a master, and hear the sobbings of parents who are separated from their children. Let us hope that the generous principles, which have so long animated the legislatures of the northern parts of the United States, will extend by degrees southward and toward those western regions where, by the effect of an imprudent and fatal law, slavery and its iniquities have passed the chain of the Alleghenies and the banks of the Mississippi. Let us hope that the force of public opinion, the progress of knowledge, the softening of manners, the legislation of the new continental republics, and the great and happy event of the recognition of Haiti by the French government, will either from motives of prudence and fear, or from more noble and disinterested sentiments, exercise a happy influence on the amelioration of the state of the blacks in the rest of the West Indies, in the Carolinas, Guyana, and Brazil. In order to slacken gradually the bonds of slavery, the laws against the slave trade must be most strictly enforced, and punishments inflicted for their infringement. Mixed tribunals must be formed, and the right of search exercised with equitable reciprocity. It is melancholy to learn that, owing to the culpable indifference of some of the governments of Europe, the slave trade, more cruel from having become more secret, has dragged from Africa within ten years almost the same number of Negroes as before 1807. But we must not, from this fact, infer the inutility or, as the secret partisans of slavery assert, the practical impossibility of the beneficent measures adopted first by Denmark, the United States, and Great Britain, and successively by all the rest of Europe. What passed from 1807 till the time when France recovered possession of her ancient colonies, and what passes in our days in nations whose governments sincerely desire the abolition of the slave trade and its abominable practices, proves the fallacy of this conclusion. Besides, is it reasonable to compare numerically the importation of slaves in 1825 and in 1806? With the activity prevailing in every enterprise of industry, what an increase would the importation of Negroes have taken in the English West Indies and the southern provinces of the United States, if the slave trade entirely free, had continued to supply new slaves, and had rendered the care of their preservation and the increase of the old population superfluous? Can we believe that the English trade would have been limited, as in 1806, to the sale of 53,000 slaves, and that of the United States to the sale of 15,000? It is pretty well ascertained that the English islands received in the 106 years preceding 1786 more than 2,130,000 negroes, forcibly carried from the coast of Africa. At the period of the French Revolution, the slave trade furnished, according to Mr. Norris, 74,000 slaves annually, of which the English colonies absorbed 38,000 and the French 20,000. It would be easy to prove that the whole of the West Indian archipelago, which now comprises scarcely 2,400,000 negroes and mulattoes, free and slaves, received from 1670 to 1825 nearly 5 million of Africans. These revolting calculations respecting the consumption of the human species do not indicate the number of unfortunate slaves who have perished in the passage or have been thrown into the sea as damaged merchandise. Note, volume 7, page 151. See also the eloquent speech of the Duc de Broglie, March 28, 1822, pages 40, 43, and 96. End of note. By how many thousands must we have augmented the loss, if the two nations most distinguished for ardor and intelligence in the development of commerce and industry, the English and the inhabitants of the United States, had continued from 1807 to carry on the trade as freely as some other nations of Europe? 
sad experiences proved how much the treaties of the fifteenth july eighteen fourteen and of the twenty second january eighteen fifteen by which spain and portugal reserved to themselves the trade in blacks during a certain number of years have been fatal to humanity End of chapter three point thirty one part five